greet you from America, if you can't tell by my accent, but I was born and raised in Africa, which you wouldn't know either. But it's so good to be back at New Germany Baptist and to see some faces, some new faces. Um, and I got to meet, I think it's Ann and Richard. Yeah. Apparently they babysitted me in Randburg when I was three. So you never know what's going to happen. Um, but my wife and I, uh, she's also American. Uh, when we were, uh, I was studying in the U.S., had the privilege to go back there and finish out some training, and lost all of my South African accent, forgot most of my Afrikaans, uh, but I met her, and on our second date, I told her, I said, you do know I'm going to Africa, and she said, I'm fine with that. And uh, we started dating in February, got married in May, uh, engaged in May, married in October, moved to South Africa, a few months into the next year and spent our, our, our life, most of our early life here in Emelaflani, Whitbank. Our children are all born there. And we just recently discovered that there's this place called Durban. <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, we, we knew Jober. I grew up in Kempton Park, Preston Primary School, and then also down Cape Town. We knew about that city, moved down there with Bill Mayer and Miles Shoulder, and uh, went to Somerset West Primary School. and. I uh, spent uh, some formative years down there, and uh, only two or three times in my life did I get to come to this place, and one of them uh, was uh, for Dustin Elliott's ordination and, uh, in this room, and what a blessing to be down here. It's surreal to be back and to hear of God's goodness and to meet some new pastors and new places. I have driven through Coxstead. I would not stop in Coxstead, <laughs> but I met somebody from Coxstead today. And uh, one time when we first moved here, I, I drove my wife to Durban and went all the way down through the old tram skies and now Eastern Cape. And we did that road all the way down, stopped and stayed all the way down the coast. And then we went up to the N1, stayed at Philippe Dam. I said, this is South Africa. And uh, what a blessing. Uh, my wife and I were based in the U.S. now, but the privilege to be back and to, to see that God is building his church. And he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And sometimes we forget, we feel like we're alone. I don't, I don't know if you're that way. In Whitbank, you know, mining city, 400 coal mines, eight power plants. Oh, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> um, sometimes you feel like you're in an island, on an island. You feel like you're alone. Um, and it's easy to be that way. Um, but it, 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 one of my burdens was for MLC was that I, we learn to humble ourselves and learn from one another. Even if we disagree with one another on a few things here or there, and you brush your teeth this way and I do that way. But the idea that, you know, if we love the Lord and his word, we can encourage one another. We can learn from one another and we can be reminded that we are not alone and that Jesus Christ is building his church. And so if you're part of New Germany today, if you're part of Grace or you're visiting today, from another church. Just thank you so much for your heart for the Lord's church. Now, I'm gonna, I am going to attempt to do something today that I, I did make it through at Benoni, but I've never done this in my life. And so we're gonna pray, and we're gonna overview the entire book of Acts in about 17 minutes. So hold on, and we need to consider what are the acts, the actions? What are the actions and acts of the Holy Spirit? It's important to do a bibliology. What did he do? Before we learn, what should we do? And so we're building a theology, a bibliology of the acts of the Holy Spirit. That was a, the topic that was given to me to church by the Holy Spirit. And it was read earlier in verse 1 of Acts 1. What does it say? So I'm going to speak American now and I'm going to just wind it up a little bit because we're just going to go whoosh. And that's fine. We won't get it all, but sometimes it's good to step back and just see. Oh, that's what he did. And we're going to make seven applications that will help us see God's acts in this church today. Verse 1, the former account, I'm reading from the New King James, he says, the former account I made. What former account? Uh, Luke wrote the, the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke was a history record 
of the ministry of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by Luke. So the former account I made, he said, I gave you a history of the gospel of Jesus. He's writing to Theophilus. Of, the, of all that Jesus began to both do. He said, I recorded what Jesus did. So what's he going to do in the book of Acts? So I recorded what Jesus did, verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up after, so he's now going to record what happened after Jesus. And notice in verse 2, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles. So the book of the Acts, we call it the Acts, the Adelina, the Acts are usually called the Acts of the Apostles. But it is also very commonly or could be commonly referred as the acts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit breaks free. Remember Jesus said, he, he, he was with you, but he will be in you. There was a new thing that God was doing. John chapter 14, 15, and 16. He says the Holy Spirit's coming. The Comforter's coming. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment to come. And so Luke opens this book. He says, I wrote to you about Jesus now I'm going to write to you about what God is going to do through His Holy Spirit by the hand of the apostles. And so it is the acts of the apostles, but it is also the acts of the Holy Spirit. And you find the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost mentioned, I believe, over 60 times in this book. We won't look at all of those, but write down, if you want to, about 20, 22. I'm summarizing some acts of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. And we will move. Lord, we ask for your help now, Father. We ask that you give us your Holy Spirit. Illuminate your Holy Word that we become like your Holy Son. That you would use us to advance your Holy Church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For many years, I have enjoyed the research and study about church health and church growth. Not in a philosophical sense, but how does God grow his church? And for the last two decades, there's been significant work done in this area. And you can find books about how to achieve health, measure growth, organize ministries, administrate problems, expand community influence, and catalyze church growth. And you'll find innumerable works on the actions. If you will do these acts... God will grow his church. Certainly in America, the tendency has been to focus on the individualism and what you do, how you and I will affect or achieve church health or church growth. But in the book of Acts, it's not that way. And we must be grounded. These books are not necessarily bad. There's some frou-frou ideas every once in a while. But the idea is before we think about the acts of you and I, we must be grounded in, but what are the acts of the Holy Spirit? The church will grow not by the acts of David McCrum or Dustin or your name, but if God will do these acts, if God will move by his spirit through his people, God will build his church. And so in chapter 1, what do we find the Holy Spirit doing? We find that the Holy Spirit indwelled the believers. We read it in verse 4 to 8, being assembled together. There were about 120 people, probably about twice this size. You think about three and a half years of ministry of Jesus Christ, and what did he have to show for it? You would look at Jesus' ministry, and you would say he was not a great church growth guru. Three and a half years, 120 people hiding in an upper room. But he told them to wait and God's spirit would come. It was an audible thing. It was a unique thing. We do not find this as the operative form of the Holy Spirit. But we do find that he demonstrated in an audible way, in a physical way, and in a spiritual way, a mighty rushing wind so that people heard inside and people even heard outside that it was happening. And he indwelled them. He indwelled them. He didn't just indwell the apostles who were present. He indwelled the women and the men. He indwelled everybody. And I had it wrong for many years so that we see in chapter 2, he communicates the gospel. And it says he filled them with the Spirit. And it says they spoke with tongues. Not the apostles. They. 
In fact, the entire congregation spoke with tongues, and people heard them in 16 different ethnic language groups. And after that, Peter got up to preach. And so this is the first of four supernatural fillings and speaking of tongues recorded in the book of Acts. Over a period of about 20 years, there are four occurrences, only four, of legitimate speaking of tongues in the book of Acts. So that the book of Acts is a descriptive book, less than a prescriptive book. Luke is just saying, let me tell you what happened. If you want to find out what we're supposed to be doing, we usually refer to the epistles. But if we find out what did the Holy Spirit do, we find the book of Acts. And it can still be very instructive as well. He indwelled the believers in chapter 2. He communicated the gospel through the entirety, the witness of these 120. In chapter 4, we find that he emboldened the apostles to preach. Notice in chapter 4 in verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. He said, well, that may have just been their personality. You remember these guys, these sons of thunder, John and his brother? Peter's outspoken. Oh, that's just who they were in their personality. No, later on in the same chapter, in verse 31 of chapter Acts, it says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So that we find their boldness was not arrogance, their boldness was not personality, but they were infused with boldness by God's Spirit. He indwelled them. He communicated through them. He emboldened them for witness. In chapter 5, he purified the church. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And several times, three times, it mentions their offense was in the context and against the Holy Spirit. He purified the Holy Church. In verse 3, Peter says, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. In verse 9 of chapter 5, then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Were Ananias and Sapphira say, very possibly, that's not the context nor the teaching of this text. But they, they had offended. They had so grieved the Holy Spirit. And I'm so glad that this is not the normal operation of the church, that every time we lie to God, he kills us. I think we'd be a much smaller group today. But in that day, he was demonstrating, I am real, and this doesn't matter, and you're done. <laughs> Woo. And fear came upon them. But it reminds us, pastors, today that God's Holy Spirit sometimes and many times and I think always still has our back. Because he purifies his church, whether through reproof of sin, the, the correction of right, the conviction of righteousness, the convincing that judgment is coming. He still purifies his church. He indwells, he communicates, he purifies. In chapter six, we find that he equipped the servants to lead. In chapter 6, it says, look ye out among you. Your leadership of the church should come within the church that is homegrown. And we'll look, come back to this later in our application. But he equipped the servants to lead. What are we looking at? These are the acts of the Holy Spirit. These are the kinds of things that he did. In chapter 7, you remember the story of Stephen. And we find in chapter 7, the Holy Spirit is now convicting. He convicted the proud and the self-righteous through Stephen's message. And it's even in Stephen's conclusion in verse 51 of Acts chapter 7. He says, you stiff-necked. <laughs> you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so do you. And so in this consternation that's welling up within him, so that the Bible says they even chewed on him. How? They gnashed on him with their teeth, it says. What was that? That was God's Spirit reproving them, reproving them. And God's Spirit still does that today. Pastors, if somebody starts biting on you, you're in good company. That God's Spirit will awaken men and women. He will reprove them of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. I remember several times in Whitbank where men and women, they would sit for sometimes years. And one day, one day, I remember meeting Tony after two years. I said, Tony, something's changed. What's happened? He said, 
About two months ago, God woke me up. I said, God, I know what happened. God woke me up. Yesterday, the host I'm staying with used those exact words. He said, no, about that and then and then. He said, and he said, I kind of just woke up. And you, hath he quickened, the Bible says. And that we see that action of the Holy Spirit, that he convicts the proud, and they will either resist him or they repent. In chapter 8, the Holy Spirit initiates cross-cultural evangelism with the Samaritans, and we start finding several Africans named also throughout the book of Acts. The first one in Acts chapter 6 we, we hear the name Niger, which was a northern African name, literally meaning black. And we find here as well to the Samaritans to the north, but now also to an Ethiopian in verse 29. And the Holy Spirit specifically speaks to this man. Go speak to that African. And you see the gospel coming into North Africa. You see it going even further north and also south. But it's God's spirit that has to reprove the church. And he sent Philip, the evangelist, north and then south, God's spirit did that because the church on their own were still too prejudiced and were not expanding. And for eight years, the New Testament church was predominantly exclusively Jewish. But the Holy Spirit initiated that and we find the second occurrence of speaking in tongues. Now, roughly eight years after Pentecost, you have the second occurrence with a second group. So in Acts chapter 2, God's spirit pours out. They speak in tongues and it confirms God is confirming himself to the Jewish people. In Acts chapter 8, he's confirming himself to the Samaritan people. And they speak in tongues. And then fast forward to chapter 9. Uh, he confirms and comforts the church. We'll come back to that in 931. I want you to see the third outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the speaking of tongues in chapter 10, where he again initiates not just cross-culture. There was some identity with Samaritans. They had history there. The Jewish people also had history with Northern Africa, some with Egypt and maybe Ethiopia. But now in chapter 10, oh my goodness, the Romans? The Romans? Remember the centurions were walking the street. The Romans were beating them. The Romans were enslaving them. And it takes a divine act of God in Peter's life with visions and spirit. And say, like, you better go speak to this guy. Cornelius. And I love this text. And it says in chapter 10 of 44 to 46. In chapter, 40, uh, chapter 10, verse 44, it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those that heard the word. Verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Again, notice, it is not even the apostles speaking in tongues. It was the people verifying. And it was a verification they have received God's Spirit. It was a visible verification that even these people can be saved. Chapter 11 is the same story all over again where the Jewish church did not believe that that was possible. And in chapter 11, Peter again cites the Holy Spirit multiple times and he says, I'm telling you, they got saved. Yeah, I don't believe that. He said, no, they spoke in tongues. Wow, then they must have had the Holy Spirit. So that tongues you'll find throughout the 20, 30 year history of Acts was never the operative experience of the New Testament, but it was the unfolding when God unfolded himself to the Jewish people, then the Samaritan people. You find about 10 years after Pentecost, the Romans get saved in the outpours again, and they speak in tongues. These are the acts of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church. This is what he did. You jump to chapter 13, and we find what we would start identifying as a, a normal formative operation of the New Testament church. We looked at chapter 13 as the commission. He commissioned the first church planting missionaries in Acts chapter 13. He had done some work. We know Timothy or um, Thomas went uh, east. We know Philip went north and south, and so people are expanding. But in chapter 8, because of the persecution, and now in chapter 13, by intentionality, not because of persecution, but intentionality in chapter 13, as they minister to the Lord in chapter 13, verse 2, and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Paul and Barnabas, uh, Barnabas and Saul. 
That was God's Holy Spirit. Not because of external forces, persecution of chapter 8, but of internal moving of God's Spirit. He was raising up people in the church and saying, this one, I want this one. And so notice the parallel statements in chapter 13 and verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they, the church, they sent them away. But verse 4 says, so being sent by the Holy Spirit. We're going to come back to that collaborative work. But these are the acts of the Holy Spirit where he commissions individuals for full-time service. In this case, essentially, what we would now call a church planning missionary endeavor. And they conduct that in chapter 13 and 14. Chapter 15, what did the Holy Spirit do? He resolved theological and ministry conflict. So people are getting saved. They don't know what to do. Do we? These Gentiles are getting saved. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. Uh, what do we do? What do we tell the Gentiles to do? So there was a lot of fights about theology and what should they do this? Should they do this? And the conclusion of that council of the churches and the apostles was this. In Acts chapter 15, verses 18 to 29. And notice a statement just as chapter 13 gave us parallel statements about the church. And the Holy Spirit will come back to this. Chapter 15 does the same thing. And gives a parallel statement. One referring to the church. One referring to the Holy Spirit. Chapter 15. It says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. But earlier he says it seemed good to us. And you start to find this collaborative nature that the Holy Spirit is sensitive. The, the, the church is sensitive to the Holy Spirit's work. We're going to come back to that. But in chapter 15, he helped resolve and, and was moving in amongst his people. In chapter 16, the Holy Spirit closed and opened gospel opportunities. And pastors and leaders, many times we are confused and confounded. We were burdened to move in a particular way. And it seems the way was shut. And we can only see the external forces. But in Acts chapter 16, the Bible says two times that Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Again in verse 7, but the Spirit did not permit them. And then later, this door opened up. This door opened. So he closed and opened opportunities in chapter 17 and 18. He again compelled believers to evangelize. In Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 17, notice first of all it says Paul's spirit. This is the famous Mars Hill or the preaching at the Areopagus. You know, uh, the, I see the altar to the unknown God. The chapter opens with his evangelism into the Jewish synagogues, but this was Grecian territory, so they were Hellenistic Jews. They were very liberal Jews, and they mixed a lot with the Greek into their Judaism. And so it was a, a very modern, educated, uppity-up city that had a lot of syncretism between Judaism and the Greek. And so Paul says he was grieved in his spirit, small s, in his spirit, because he saw the whole city was given to idolatry. So then we had the famous Mars Hill preaching. But notice in chapter 18, again, a parallel statement in chapter 17 and verse 16, Paul says his spirit was provoked within him. But notice, how does God do that? In chapter 18, a similar occurrence and a similar statement in verse 5. When Saul and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit, capital S. That we start to grow in our maturity as leaders, that we get, begin to discern when is God's spirit moving my spirit to take on a new gospel opportunity challenge. That's an act of the Holy Spirit. He compels believers to evangelize and try through new things and to reach into new areas. And His Spirit compels our spirit that we say, we've got to do this, but it won't work. I don't care. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. In the end of chapter 16 and 17, it does say, Many, some said we will hear thee again of this matter. Others mock and says, but some believe. We do not measure the success of the, the movement by how many got saved. Many times God's Spirit is compelling us. These are the works of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 19, he convinced leaders with direction in ministry. 
Paul says, and he begins to allude to this in chapter 19, and it would shape the rest of the book of Acts. He alludes to it in chapter 19. He says in verse 21, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, capital S, when he had passed through Macedonia, Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also go to Rome. I must see Rome. And that takes up a, a theme in his writing. He feels this compelling. I'm, I'm leading. And I remember sometimes sharing with people, I believe, I believe God is leading me to do this. If, if I get it wrong, that's on me. But as best as I know, I believe God is leading me to do this. And there is disagreement about Paul's decision. We'll get to that in chapter 21. But notice we have a, a parenthesis in chapter 20 where God, through his Holy Spirit, expands the gospel influence everywhere, even in the face of difficulty. He says again, small s in chapter 20, verse 22, he says, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. His spirit, small s, not knowing what will befall me there, verse 23, except that the spirit testifies, excuse me, in every city saying that change and tribulation await me. He says, I moved in my spirit and God's spirit has confirmed that wherever I go, chains are waiting for me. He says, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to go to Jerusalem. It's interesting that in chapter 20, um, we find that he ordained shepherds for his people. We'll get to the conflict in 21. But notice he calls all the Ephes the leaders of the Ephesian, or the, the, the leaders of Ephesus, those church groups, he calls them together. He, he gives them, he expounds his ministry philosophy, his MO, in several verses. But notice he says in verse 28 of 20, he says, Therefore take heed to yourselves to the flock. If you are here today, you may be a formal pastor or an informal pastor. I remember speaking to one of the ladies in our church in, in Whitbank. I said, you are one of our best pastors. And she freaked out. I'm not a pastor. I said, you are. I watch how you shepherd our women. So there's an office of elder pastor. There's offices of deacon. But there is also a gifting there. The, the gifts of God, they, they fall upon us not by gender or race or ethnicity. Gifts and offices are different things. And here he says to the leaders, he says, but notice, among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers and shepherds. And he also calls them elders. And that's one right why I take pastor, elder, and overseer as one. I don't want to fight you about that. You can apologize to me in heaven. That's <laughs> Dustin's uh, phrase I've learned. But here, notice, for our state, it is an act of the Holy Spirit. He says, I've called you to be a shepherd. That's God's spirit. So we get to the conflict in chapter 21, where God's spirit speaks uniquely to different leaders. Remember chapter 19, chapter 20, Paul says, my spirit has been convinced by God's spirit that I must go to Jerusalem. And I have this compunction for Rome, and I know it's going to be tough. But the local leaders, by prophecy of the Holy Spirit in verse 4 and 5 of chapter 21, they told Paul through the spirit not to go to Jerusalem. And there's differing opinions here, but the consensus is that they were saying, Paul, God has revealed when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be persecuted. And Paul says, I know. But notice how they resolve it. Paul doesn't leave early, he stays with them seven days, and they say, the will of the Lord be done. And they gave them his, they gave him their blessing, and they committed it. This is the Lord. Will be so that even when the leaders disagree, we have the wisdom and the patience and the deference and the humility to say, you must follow God's spirit. And we're not talking about major areas of doctrine. We're talking about God is leading me. I believe I must do this. Well, I disagree. God's spirit is saying this to me. And you know what? God's spirit was speaking to both. And neither one knew the final implications of that. And they said, all right, well, we give you our blessing. We give you our blessing. 
In chapter 23, we again see what did God's spirit do? He spoke as the voice of God. And it's interesting when Paul is giving his testimony between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the different groups, some of the Jewish leaders, the more Hellenistic ones, they did not believe in spirits and angels. They did not believe in the supernatural. But the other group did. And so Paul plays upon that and he tells them, you know, about a spirit and an angel. He tells that God revealed himself. And notice the words of these unbelievers in Acts 23 and verse 9 and 10. It says, there arose a large outcry. And the scribes of the Pharisees arose and protested, saying, we find no evil. The scribes were more conservative. And they did believe in supernatural. And they were arguing, said, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And say, hey, if God's spirit's moving, then we don't want to move against that. That God speaks. And so we have a silent several chapters where the Holy Spirit is not mentioned. And Paul is detailing, Luke is detailing these shipwrecks and these stories and these testimonies. But Paul concludes in the very last few verses of the book in Acts 28. He again closes the book with the Holy Spirit. And he's bound in prison. This is when he writes many of his books. When many leaders come to meet with him. He's in one place. They can come and see him. He's under house arrest. He can receive guests every day. I believe he had new Roman guard every eight hours. And so he's evangelizing. We see God opens up. He influences even the church of Rome. We sign in, Acts chapter, in Romans chapter 16 where uh, 27 people are named. There are leaders in Romans, Roman, the, the household, Caesar's household. Did he win some of them to the Lord here? We don't know. But he ends in verse 25 and he says, The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah. So just as the Holy Spirit moves to the apostles, he moves to the prophets, saying, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. And, see, and I won't read the whole thing. But what does Paul say? He says, When God's word is read, the Holy Spirit is speaking. That's something we do in Whitbank today. Whenever we would read the word of God, we say, God is speaking. We're all looking for some experience and something. You know, I'm waiting to hear God's voice. Let us open his word. God's spirit is speaking every time we hear his word. Because he wrote the word. And we're asking him to speak again, fresh and new, and convince and illuminate. But these are the acts of the Holy Spirit. And Luke is writing this history. He is describing these amazing acts. And many times he even specifies these were unique. <laughs> Don't expect to see this again. Like one time Paul pulls out his hanky and sends his hanky and a guy gets, you know, healed or something. It's like, yeah, don't expect to see that again. He did special things. He did special things. Luke says that many times. We find tongues only four times. And personally, my position is that I have no problem with tongues as long as you do it as they did in the, book of the, the books of the Bible and you follow the seven rules of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I have no problem with that. I've never seen it done. And I've never seen a church that speaks in tongues follow the rules of 1 Corinthians 14. They break all of them. So that it's not that God's spirit is silenced that he doesn't do the sign gifts anymore, that he's, he's somehow been, you know, curtailed. No, he can still do all of those things. And I think in very, very rare cases, God's spirit still does. But they are not the operative gifts of the New Testament church. Why? Because we see the acts of the Holy Spirit. We're dynamic and magnanimous and just like, whoa. But when you see the operation of the Holy Spirit, where do we go to? We go to the gospel. You say, then, then what help does this book have for us? And I will leave with you seven words this morning. And I think we started late because I have five more minutes. I didn't know how strict you are. You got a black suit on. I'm <laughs> In Acts chapter... 1 through 28, we, we find several acts of the Holy Spirit. And I want to summarize these into several words for you this morning that we can find corroborated in the New Testament epistles. But what can New Germany Baptist Church do? What can uh, 
What can Grace Baptist Church do? What can your church do? We see when these acts, what do we do with this? Word number one would be wait. As a church, learn to wait on God's spirit. And you find this on several occasions in the book of Acts, how did, the church was learning to, to get along with the Holy Spirit. They, they, they had not engaged with the Holy Spirit before. This was new. So we do find progression of understanding and interpretation and application. That's why Acts is not generally a, a prescriptive, do these things, it's more a descriptive, this was what was done. But they learn to wait. How does a church wait on God's Spirit? Three ways. It waits collectively. So we call the church an organized assembly. The church must constantly and continually be collecting itself. In, in however you want to do that. In homes, in a specified place, in a public place, we, are, we collect ourselves together. They, from the very first one, they met in the upper room. They were always gathering we are assembly. We must always be assembly. Do not forsake the assembly. How many times? I don't know. It doesn't say. What time? What days? What hours? I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> but do it. They, they waited collectively, and then they waited prayerfully. Then you have designated times when groups or the entire congregation meets for prayer to say, Lord, we're seeking you. We're waiting on you. When we meet collectively and prayerfully, we are acknowledging, God, we need you. That is not just in a formal prayer when a minister or a leader prays, but in group prayer where we are seeking the Lord. It may be a ladies' Bible study, a ladies' Bible study. But I'm trying to let you understand when you do that thing, we are waiting on God's Spirit. God the Father, in Jesus' name, move with your Spirit in our church. So we wait collectively, prayerfully, and expectantly. They always expected God to move. They always expected God to move. And I feel that that's probably missing in many of our prayers. It's more, well, we're expecting God to change us. We're expecting, you know, it was Carthas, it was a Carthas. It, it helped us. No. Prayer, God, we are meeting as a body. To God the Father, in Jesus' name, would you move by your Holy Spirit in the lives of these unbelievers, in the lives of these believers. God, we are asking you to act. Act. And so we learn to wait on God's Spirit. We can have our programs, we have things, but we must wait collectively, prayerfully, and spectrally for God's Spirit to act on our behalf. So we, we wait on God's Spirit. Word number two is then we move. We wait, and then we move with God's Spirit. So that when we see God's work, and God's hand, and His leading, and compunction, and His burden, then we, act, we move with that. We move with that. And so it is perfectly appropriate for individual churches to have unique ministries and unique things. Why? Because God's Spirit is moving. And he's saying, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. And so the churches should find no competition. Well, we have to do what they, well, we don't have this program. They have that program. It's not about programs. It's about the movement of God's spirit. And when God moves, we act. And we find the greatest and the first example of this at the end of Acts chapter 2. Remember what happened after Pentecost? What happened? Then those that gladly received his word. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And, and it delineates what did they do? When God's Spirit moved, what did they do? These verses have become the, the, the grounding, the foundation of the actions of the New Testament church. And I counted 10 things that they did at the end of Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. Notice they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were baptized, then they gathered together, then they grew in the apostles' doctrine, then they fellowshiped together, then they witnessed of God's works to others, they provided for the needs of others, they praised God publicly, they served each other with simplicity, and they always evangelized. Guess what? That, that should sound like your church. If you're not doing those things, you need to change. Not just some book or new study. Read those things. But these are how the New Testament church responded when God's Spirit moved. Now you're probably doing more here than there or better here than there. That's fine. 
But when God's Spirit moves, we move with Him. So we wait on Him, and then we move with Him. Number three, the word is trust. So it picks back on number one, but the word trust. That we trust in God's Spirit through the process of ministry. So you're starting to see a cycle here. We wait, and then we move. But once we're moving, we do not now trust in our moving. Say, yeah, well, we got this figured out. And now we're good at this. And you probably are better at some ministries than others. But even in that ministry cycle, there was a continual trusting on God's spirit to do the spiritual work. And notice some of these passages in the book of Acts where God's spirit moved. So then they started doing the life of the church. They just did the life of the church. And as they did the life of the church, listen to these records. In verse 47 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who would be saved. So they said, okay, we're going to move and do these things. But we're trusting in God. And he moved. In chapter 4, in verse 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. In chapter 5, in verse 14, and the believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. In Acts chapter 11, verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. I love how Acts counts things. There's so many numbers. If you're in accounting, go through the book of Acts and just see how many things were counted and what was counted. A great example of this in Acts chapter 19, verses 18 to 20. And many who had believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic, sorcery, which was also in the New Testament connected to drugs. And we had the word pharmacy, pharmaceutical, translated in the King James, witchcraft or sorcery. They used drugs to have psychedelic experiences in their spiritual experiences. Those were often connected, the drugs with sorcery. And notice what happened. Those who had practiced magic or sorcery or witchcraft, they brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Notice what he counted. And they counted up the value of those things that they were burning. A total of 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, if you want an exchange rate, Judas had 30 pieces of silver, and they bought an entire graveyard with 30 pieces of silver. 50,000. God's moving. Why? Because it, now once we move with God's spirit, we trust God's spirit. If we do what we're supposed to do, he's going to keep working. He's going to keep working. So just as we wait and then we move, so word number three, we trust. And number four, but we also work. We work. We work alongside the Holy Spirit. And for me, I love the example in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, there's been explosive growth in the church. And they said, we don't know what to do. We don't have to organize it. The widows aren't being fed. And there was also ethnic tension. We had the Hebrew Jews and we had the Hellenistic Jews. And they said there's, there was a lot of ethnic contact conflict in the church. They were both Jewish, but they came from, from Alexandria and some of that area. and then, So they, they were from different areas. They had different opinions. And this group wasn't getting taken care of. And they, they delineated a threefold way of how to choose leaders in the church. They said, look ye out among you. Who are we looking for? We're looking for people who have spiritual actions. It says men of good report. It says they have to already be doing spiritual things before we choose them. They have to have spiritual actions. They have to have spiritual attitudes. It says full of the Holy Spirit. They need to be spiritual people. And it says spiritual abilities. Whom we may appoint over this business of ministry. They have to have the ability to administrate and lead. And so you find collaboration. That the, Holy, the New Testament church was learning to collaborate with the Holy Spirit. In the selection of their leaders. They were collaborating in Acts chapter 6. They were collaborating in their gospel expansion. We find that in Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 8. You find their gospel expansion. They collaborate with the Holy Spirit. You find they also collaborated for church unity to make decisions and solve problems in Acts chapter 15. And so that the Holy Spirit grows in the life of your church. You grow in your ability to collaborate with the Holy Spirit. To wait on Him collectively and prayerfully, expectantly. You say, well, this is a problem we need to solve. Let's pray and seek God that we ask His Holy Spirit to move in Acts. Hey, we need evangelism and outrage. Wait, let's be collectively and, and wait on God's spirit. When he moves, we will trust him and then we will work. Word number five, measure. What do we do? We, we wait on him. 
we move with Him. What do we do? We trust in Him. We start to, we learn how to work with Him. Number five, we measure. I do think it is spiritual work to measure your attendance, to measure your offering, to measure where's our influence, to measure that we find it is a spiritual thing to measure. We find it is a spiritual thing to have business meetings and to invite God's spirit into your finance, to invite God's spirit into your leadership decisions. It is spiritual thing to do the work of the church. And so we measure. They measured many things, but the word I would use, I would say measure everything, but also measure spiritual fruit. And you find that we're not taking time today on that, but that is what is filled through the, the epistles, the letters to the churches. They kept measuring spiritual fruit. Are these people spiritual? And I would spend a little time on number five and six. They're not delineated in the Gospels. They're delineated in the epistles. Measure spiritual fruit, number five, and discover and unleash spiritual gifts. That would be number six. Discover and unleash spiritual gifts. And you find that in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. And I will leave with you and turn with me to Acts chapter 9, and we'll read one verse and be done. So number five, measure spiritual fruit. Number six, discover and unleash spiritual gifts. And number seven, I would leave this word with you. And the word is rest. Rest. <laughs> Acts chapter 9 is a, is a bit of a hiatus after the persecution of Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> we know the situation with Paul, how he was converted. The Damascus Road experience. And so there's, there's insane and intense persecution. In the old King James, it says he hailed men and women. It literally means he dragged them by the hair to prison. And he was consenting to, to Stephen's death. He held their coats, remember? So this was, a, this was an absolutely brutal time in the life of the New Testament church. In Acts chapter 8. That was the first gospel expansion from external pressures. Acts chapter 13 was from internal, the awakening of God's spirit to send him out. But in Acts chapter 9, so after this, there was a hiatus, Paul gets converted, there's a, there's a rest of persecution, and notice in verse 31, and this is what we obviously would wish for the churches of South Africa, it says, and the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. They had peace. And were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and notice, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. These are the acts of the Holy Spirit. And God's Holy Spirit, He longs to continually act in your church. He does what He wills. But as a church body, we need to grow in our awareness of Him and what He is doing to learn to wait on Him, to move with Him, to trust in Him while we do the work of the ministry, to measure Him, but also identify what he's already done and unleash that so that as a body of believers, we can rest in God's spirit and he will multiply his church. Lord, we ask now that you give us wisdom to discern what you are doing and then to move with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.